Up next is Deb Grobner from Education Specialist from the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're going to start off with a quiz. Okay, quiz time, pop quiz. Uh, let's see if you can answer this question. The state of Minnesota is known as the land of 10,000 dancers. <laughs> lakes, right. For those of you who said lakes, you are correct. I'm not sure what's going on over here. Uh, <laughs> we are indeed the, uh, the land of 10,000 lakes, and uh, we have many beautiful large lakes. Um, we actually have more than 10,000 lakes, and um, as well as a lot of river resources in our state. And big lakes are a big deal in Minnesota, so I'll be focusing on, on some large lakes. And they're a big deal in large part because they provide excellent fishing opportunities um, for people in Minnesota and, um, and, and tourists who come to visit Minnesota. So whole family traditions have grown up around fishing, family memories, of course, and um, community festivals and uh, a lot of businesses have grown up to support fishing on our large lakes. In fact, uh, in direct retail sales in Minnesota, anglers spend $2.4 billion a year. And a lot of that money goes toward the pursuit of this fish, or Minnesota State fish. Who can identify this fish? Walleye. walleye, right. So Minnesotans are wild about walleye. And when we think of prime walleye fishing, we think of the legendary Lake Mille Lacs. And Lake Mille Lacs is in the, the center of our state here, right there. And it is uh, just about two hours north of the Twin Cities metro area. So Minneapolis, St. Paul is located approximately at, um, at the star there. And that's of note because um, half of the state's population lives in that metro area. So at least half of the state's population is within two hours of Lake Mille Lacs. So you can imagine it gets a lot of fishing pressure. Um, it's legendary because of, of the way it has produced walleye in the past. So natural reproduction of walleye in Lake Mille Lacs has been compared to a walleye factory. It just seemed like the walleye uh, would just continue endlessly and would provide endless fishing opportunities for, for people. Um, and in fact, because of its location in the center, central part of the state and its popularity for fishing, Mille Lacs has been one of the most well-studied large lakes in uh, Minnesota. So we know a lot about the, the history of the lake, and in particular, the walleye fishery that, that is in the lake. But there are signs that the walleye factory may not uh, be producing as much walleye as it has in the past. So we've seen declines over time in terms of fisheries research. Um, one particularly notable statistic was in a five-year period, researchers found uh, a 50% decline in the walleye biomass of the lake in just the five-year period. Um, now there's some signs that, uh, that, that the walleye population is is recovering in some ways, but in order to conserve the, the population that's there and um, make sure that we have walleye to fish uh, in the future in Lake Mille Lacs, the Department of Natural Resources has instituted um, a variety of kind of uh, restrictive fishing limits that will help um, conserve the population, including, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I skipped to my next slide. Um, what we're seeing in addition to that, that drop, the 50% uh, drop in the five-year period, where other research is showing that there's a low survival rate for baby walleye, which of course leads to fewer adult walleye, and the, the walleye they're being caught, whether it's in the gill nets or by people, we're seeing they're skinnier and they're hungry. And uh, how many anglers do we have in this room? How many people like to go fishing? Okay, so quite a few. And a hungry fish makes for great fishing, right? Because they're, they're bite. So the bite is really hot in Mille Lacs right now, even though the walleye population as a whole is showing decline. And that's why it's particularly uh, difficult for some, some to swallow the more restrictive um, fishing limits that we have instituted on Mille Lacs over the last few years in particular. 
um, including uh, walleye season closures mid-season uh, to, to protect the population after our catch quota has been uh, exceeded for the year, and um, also instituting a catch and release only season. Um, and in fact, we just announced a couple of days ago at the beginning of this week, the Minnesota Department Re of Natural Resources said that this year we are going to have a catch and release season on Mille Lacs for, for walleye. So um, that has some people boiling mad, mm -hmm. as, you, as you can imagine, with people with whole family traditions around catching walleye and eating walleye, very tasty fish. Um, anglers are, are, some anglers are rather unhappy about it. And, um, including the, um, the businesses that depend on, on walleye for tourism um, are also uh, kind of irritated by some of these uh, more restrictive fishing limits. So to the, to the point where there's some protests and things like that involved, so there's a lot of emotion around uh, conserving the walleye population. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about our approach that we're taking, one approach that we're taking to try to bridge that gap between what we understand, the science of what's happening in Lake Mille Lacs, what's going on beneath the water and above the water that's causing the decline in the walleye population. Um, and so what we're doing is uh, developing interpretation to help people understand what those changes mean in the ecosystem, um, what we know and what we, what we don't know as well. We don't have all all of the answers. So my goal for this project was to, to use systems thinking to develop interpretation that helps people understand why and how the lake is changing and, um, and how that will impact the fish and fishing, how it will impact the people as well. Um, as well as to talk a little bit more or help people understand the ways that scientists study the lakes and um, kind of how, how we know what we, what we know and the limits of, of that knowledge as well. So, what's going on? What's causing the decline in the walleye population? There are lots of different opinions out there, um, some supported by science, or some conclusions supported by science, and then some that are, are more of opinions. But these are some of the things that are, are floating around out there um, as, as far as potential causes for the decline in walleye. Um, and they, they can include things like, you know, the DNR is, is horrible, and we, we've screwed everything up, and it's all our fault, um, to bigger, more complex issues like um, climate change, of course, and invasive species, which we've heard a little bit uh, about already here. So with all of these potential ways or causes to the walleye decline, like where, where do we start with that? And how do we try to tease out that, that story? And to be honest, it, it, was, it was a little overwhelming to me um, to dive into this project. I don't have a team around me. Um, this is just me trying to wrap my head around what's happening with these changes and how do we, how do we communicate that to people in a really engaging and relevant way. And as I try to muddle through all of these, uh, these factors in my head, it, it seemed like it was this giant hairball of just you know, nasty, that, that wicked water issue where there are human factors um, in terms of you know, uh, tribal fishing and the e economic side. And then there are um, some, some other factors like invasive species and water clarity issues. And there's a lot of money tied up in, in all of this as well. So where do you start? <laughs> well, I found systems thinking and um, looking at DSRP, as we've heard about earlier today, useful for combing through the complex stories that, that are interwoven in that giant hairball of a messy problem and to try to comb out the essentials that, that underlie the, the complexity of that story. So I would like to share with you uh, a few things that I've learned in my journey and, and developing this interpretation. So um, the first thing we needed to decide or we need to decide as uh, the Department of Natural Resources is what is the story that we want people to understand? Um, 
and focusing down even more, what is the science story, the mental model that we want, um, we hope that people will understand as far as how those factors are interacting to cause a decline in the walleye population. So in order to develop story, this, this it, map kind of shows my uh, initial hairball <laughs> approach where you're just trying to get down all the information and look at the different factors that are involved um, that could be contributing to the walleye decline. Um, this is looking mostly at the, the science aspects. Um, I had to set some boundaries for myself and not try to involve the uh, economic side of the story at first anyway, so we're narrowing down. And I'm going to show, I don't expect you to be looking at the specific specifics of this model or uh, the next, uh, next one that follows. Merely, I'm just sharing, sharing them as a progression in, in my thinking and, re and a re refinement. So we, um, you know, I went from that complex model and we're starting to uh, try to, to group major drivers of, of the system and what's, what's happening in the, um, the natural ecosystem. And then the next version would be refining even further and trying to be, um, trying to lump some of those drivers into kind of higher level relationships that people can understand um, without diving into all of the, um, the, the natural history and the science of, of the ecosystem right off the bat. So, looking at um, major change drivers, for example, and this is a draft map, you know, the, all of these maps that we're sharing today, I think are, you know, they're, they're working maps and this one is no exception. Um, you know, and all of these things are inter interrelated as well, but you know, people, invasive species, and climate change are being major impacts on walleye populations as well as the carrying capacity of the lake, and including the walleye habitat and the walleye um, food web. And those are the areas where our research is focusing on trying to understand the drivers is on the impacts of, of, uh, that they're having on the, the walleye population, the habitat, and the, the food chain. Okay, so that's how we're trying to tackle the story. Um, or that's the start of a mental model that will become part of the story. And now I'm going to switch a little bit more to the process of developing um, the interpretation and something I learned very important about audiences. Um, in terms of an interpretive approach, a very linear version or a lame version, like Derek talked about earlier, very linear, would be to start with the problem of, or the, the issue and the development process, and that would be DNR Minaqua. That's my program that I work for. And the, I was asked to develop interpretive media, which will then be disseminated to the audience, um, which the public audience was what we were thinking about, OK? Um, and I just wanted to mention briefly, I'm speaking of interpretive media in general sense. We haven't decided what exact vehicle we will use to tell the interpretive story. Some ideas that have been uh, floated out there would be a brochure or a poster or an exhibit or sign, something like that. So a product, a product orientation. And in interpretive development, it's important to, um, to involve the, or to have the audience in mind when you're developing the interpretation. So to understand uh, what the audience's questions are and what their needs are will help us produce a better product. Um, but I started with internal partners inside the Department of Natural Resources, so fisheries staff um, and state parks staff, uh, for example, and asked them to contribute to the story, my understanding of the mental model and, um, and uh, what they feel would be the most important components of that story. And in those conversations, I found out that we also have this internal audience, or I have this internal audience for this interpretation. And that is the, the staff, my colleagues. Um, they also seek to understand changes in the lake ecosystem. And they are concerned about the changes that we're seeing. They would like to answer questions with accurate information. And they are looking for better ways to tell the story. So here we're moving away from a product focus uh, to more of a, a systems approach, more of a network of, of communicating um, the story by helping the people who are telling the story, the storytellers in our agency. So 
the interpretation has been moved down here from that linear model. And um, it's just recognizing that the interpretation helps our internal, uh, internal partners, whether it's fisheries or state parks or eco waters, ecological and water services, and how they can share the story with public audiences. It also helps us internally develop our mental models so that we can be more consistent communicators. So instead of staying in our individual silos with our uh, divisional perspectives on the Lake Mille Lac story, we can blow up those silos and develop more of an agency ecosystem of communication um, and think about how we're interacting with public audiences and how we can maximize our resources uh, to tell a consistent and coherent story about what's happening in Lake Mille Lacs. So we can disrupt silos and we can have conversations that matter about, um, about the lake and what we know about it and what we don't know about it. And in doing so, we recognize that there's some synergistic relationships um, possible within our own agency that can help us tell the story as individuals and, um, and as an organization. Uh, for example, we can, we can look at ways to work together with between silos like fisheries and state parks. And there are many other internal audiences, but just for simplicity, I started with those. And we can also look within our silos for ways to improve our, our synergy and be able to tell the story collectively and um, in a very positive way. I know that you can't see the details of this map. I just provide it as a, uh, an example of the ways that once you understand those relationships within the agency, that you can uh, think about some innovative ways to build capacity by building support for the people who are telling the story and build community of storytellers. So in sum, systems thinking has been helpful for uh, developing story, a mental model for, um, for interpretation and combing through with, uh, by looking at uh, the DSRP, the components of the story. And systems thinking is also valuable to create synergy and identify unique relationships within uh, organizational units that will help us be more adaptive in how we tell the story of changing lakes, which are sure to continue changing. If we adapt our communication strategy to match, we will hopefully have a, a more informed citizenry and also feel really good about the story that we're telling. Thank you.